Hej alla, jag heter Maja Åse. Det är jag som ska göra den här häftiga grejen på scen med Greta Thunberg och George Monbiot. Och det är ganska stort publikintresse. Nu är det så att vi har fått ett mycket sent återbud. Och det är därför vi har dröjt. George Monbiot är här, kommer vara uppkopplad, men Greta kommer inte. Jag tycker vi ger, ja, jag tycker vi ger en, en stor applåd ändå för allt hon gör. Hi there, George. Hi. I just told them that you are amazing, but the thing is that Greta is uh, a no-show. Too bad, but uh, I'm, I'm you sorry are. That she's unwell. I hope she's okay. Yeah. So, uh, welcome to Bookmessan in Gothenburg and Globala Torget. Now we have an hour of uh, interesting intellectual talk, demanding, inviting, inspiring, factful on climate crisis or what it actually is the ongoing collective suicide of mankind and the collapse of all living creatures on Earth. And my name is Maya Åse, and uh, the audience are leaving. I urge you to stay. He's superb and extremely interesting. This is going to be so interesting. Please stay. Give George Monbiot a big hand. He's the one. Great. So. Alla ni som står upp, det finns lite platser här och sitt kvar, det kommer bli superintressant. Han är superspännande. This is George Monbiot and uh, your friends with Greta Thunberg. And I who is going to interview you is Maja Åse. I work for the Swedish trade union organization Union to Union. We through development cooperation in Swedish utvecklingssamarbete och bistånd. We fight for human rights, decent work, living wages, freedom of speech, democracy, and of course, a just transition, a just transition to a sustainable, fossil-free world and future for all, globally. Right. So, my guest here, George Monbiot, you call yourself not only a writer and a journalist, but a professional troublemaker. Why is that? Well, all the freedoms that we have acquired, the freedom to speak freely as we are doing now, the freedom to vote, even the weekend, came about through troublemaking. They came about through civil disobedience. Civil disobedience, direct political action, is the bedrock of democracy. There would be no democracy without it. Democracy cannot be sustained without it. Um, Greta's example is a glowing example around the world. And of course, it, it builds on the work of many great um, exponents of civil disobedience in the past, whether it's the civil rights movement in the United States, whether it's the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, whether it was Gandhi's anti-imperialist movement in, in India, um, the suffragettes in the United Kingdom. We, we have seen civil disobedience being the most important force on earth for changing politics in the direction of justice. And now that environmental justice must be front and center of our concerns, because without um, uh, 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 drastic and highly effective environmental action, there can be no justice for anyone. Then troublemaking, in other words, civil disobedience, is even more important in this sphere than it has been in the past. But why isn't it enough just to sit home in your sofa and say something needs to be done? Why? Yeah, well, I mean, here in Sweden, people are actually gluing themselves to the streets, fighting for wetlands, and it's a big discussion that this is not politically correct. Why mm. do you ch uh, choose to be a climate activist? Well. We're always being told that what we're doing is, is wrong, um, that we should just sit at home and vote uh, every four or five years. And then um, we are presumed to have consented to everything the government does 
for the next four or five years. Now, we don't accept the principle of presumed consent in sex. Why should we accept it in politics? It is preposterous, this idea that we just need to vote once um, every four or five years, and then we leave it to the government to decide how the country should be run. I mean, what are we voting for when we vote? Um, you know, very often, um, the party we vote for doesn't get in at all, and we have no representation, um, uh, we, or, or much less representation than we would wish. Did we vote for every single thing that the ruling parties put in their platforms? No, no one voted for that. In fact, most people don't read the platforms at all. Did we vote for every single thing that the ruling parties are going to do that they didn't put in their platforms? Obviously, we did not. If democracy is to be a real thing, it needs to be constantly responsive. It needs to be listening to the people all the time. The people need to make themselves heard. In fact, democracy, if it's to be real, should be far more participatory and deliberative than the democracy that we see anywhere on earth today. Um, we, we see elements of participatory democracy which we should be building on. For instance, Beta Reykjavik in Iceland, Decidi Madrid in Spain, um, uh, the participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre in Brazil, the V Taiwan program in Taiwan. The, these all give good examples of how we can greatly improve democracy, make it more responsive to the people. But even they don't give us that full control, which really democracy means. It means devolving control from the center to the people. And until we get that, well, we have to make our voices heard by whatever means we can. And we have to bring these crucial neglected issues and the most crucial and the most neglected of all issues are environmental issues. We have to bring them to the front and center of people's minds. And direct action, whether it is sitting outside the Swedish parliament, as, as Greta started her, her, her campaigning with, or whether it is gluing yourself to the road, this is an absolutely essential component of ensuring that these crucial yeah. issues are heard. You get applause. Now, we don't only have a climate uh, crisis, we have a, de a democratic crisis, workers' crisis, hunger crisis, economic crisis, energy crisis, food crisis, biological crisis, political crisis, mental crisis. And I wonder, George, how did we get into this mess? <laughs> well, obviously there's no single answer to that, but a very large part of the problem has been the governing ideology of our times, which is called neoliberalism. And it's quite amazing how few people know what neoliberalism is or can easily define it. It's as if the people of the Soviet Union didn't know what communism was. Um, th this is the dominant ideology in most nations today, and they've just doubled down on it big time here in the United Kingdom with this new unelected government run by Liz Truss. Um, and it's the doctrine which says that the market must take precedence over politics. And what that means is that money takes precedence over democracy, the power of money. And what that in turn means is that rich people rule. It, it's, it's, a, it's a formula for oligarchy. It's putting the rich people in charge, listening to what they say, doing what they want. And what they want is, is less tax. They want less regulation, in other words, fewer public protections for workers, for the living world, um, for, um, uh, for, for children, for, for all the things that need protecting so urgently. They want less to that. They want to destroy trade unions. Um, and they want everything to be reduced to this transactional relationship between buyers and sellers. And they believe that if that transactional relationship becomes complete, then there will be a natural hierarchy. The winners will be those who are most successful at selling stuff and the losers will be those who are least successful. And that's the way it ought to be. And any public service or uh, social security or social program which impedes that discovery of winners and losers is, they believe, an affront to the natural order and must be stopped. Now, 
they've taken this in many countries as far as they've been able to push it so far. As we're seeing in the United Kingdom, at right now, they, they're, they're experimenting with pushing it even further. Basically, the, the destruction of the state, or in Steve Bannon's words, the deconstruction of the administrative state. That is the aim, because they see the state and its provision for people and the public services, the protections that it offers us, they see that as the impediment to their ability to make as much money as they can. But and why do the, we allow this to happen? Why do yeah, we sit well, here and allow this to happen? Because we are subjected to a barrage of propaganda um, from the billionaire media, in other words, the media owned by billionaires who are themselves, of course, oligarchs. They're from the same class who don't, don't want public protections. They don't want to be taxed. They don't want trade unions. Um, we see it even from public service broadcasters to a remarkable extent, particularly here, here in the United Kingdom. Um, we see it through these so-called think tanks, which are really lobby groups, um, trying to change the nature of politics, many of whom refuse to say where their money comes from, but from leaks we discover that it comes from, guess what, oligarchs and corporations, and these become the voices of, of, of those organizations. And so we are profoundly misled as to where our political choices lie. There was a um, study by two uh, US political scientists, um, Christopher Archin um, and, oh, someone Bartles, I can't remember, um, um, uh, called Democracy for Realists. And in, in that they said, the great majority of people possess no, um, no useful political information whatsoever. We are kept in the dark. We are kept in profound ignorance, and then we are easily misled. A, a political education, political engagement, it requires an awful lot of reading, an awful lot of, of deep study to know where we really stand. And most people do not have the time and the energy for that. But so now, now you have an audience here in Gothenburg, the just, just the, the audience here, who is a bit disappointed that Greta Thunberg isn't here, but the wonderful George Monby is here. Uh, they are all uh, informed, active, intellectual, book readers, voters, democratic lovers. What should we do immediately after you stop talking? What should we do? <laughs> well, mobilize. That's the key thing. Never do anything by yourself politically. It's the only thing that works in, in politics is combination with other people in the form of movements. And Greta's Friday for, Fridays for Future movement is a brilliant example of this. Now, there's a very hopeful aspect to this. In that, um, the, uh, there's a lot of science now, both observational and experimental science, showing that society, in common with other complex systems, has tipping points, crucial thresholds, that if we cross those thresholds, it can change from one equilibrium point to another equilibrium point. And interestingly, almost all those results point to roughly the same point, about 25% penetration of a new idea or a new perspective, and then almost everyone in society swings round to that new idea or new perspective. Let me give you an example, which is marriage equality. Now, it wasn't long ago that across Europe, marriage equality was largely considered by most people as an appalling idea. It was going to be the end of civilization as we know it. Everything was going to collapse if gay people were allowed to marry. And then just a few years later, it was the opposite. Almost everyone accepts marriage equality. It would be so stupid and bigoted not to accept it. So, so what changed in that very short amount of time? Well, what changed was that gay rights activists very successfully, through often through direct action and other forms of disobedience and through very effective campaigning, they widened the circle of social acceptance of this idea that marriage equality was a fundamental right. And, and they, they preach to the choir. Preaching to the choir is a very good thing because you, you, you preach to the immediate circle around you and then that circle preaches to the next circle and that circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches 25% of the population and then the population tips. We're socially minded creatures. We see that, that the wind has changed and so we turn round to catch that new wind. Now, there was, there was a study published specifically on Fridays for Future, on the movement that, that Greta's school strike started, right? And it showed that 
in, in, in tw at the end of 2019, Fridays for Future was on the verge of reaching that tipping point across Europe, that, that we were very, very close to 25%. And it really looked as if it was going to happen in 2020. And then the pandemic came and pretty well stopped it dead because we could no longer mobilize. We could no longer get out onto the streets. We could no longer use the power of direct action, the power of mobilization to, to keep expanding that circle. So here we are now having, in effect, to start all over again. It's extremely frustrating, but at the same time, it's quite hopeful because it shows how close we got and, and it shows it can be done. Now you talk about hope, but I've seen some, yeah, he's worth an applaud. <laughs> now you speak quite hopeful, but I've seen some interviews that you actually start crying. You're, you're a middle-aged white male intellectual actually starting crying when you talk about climate crisis. Why is that? Well, because it's... If we allow this to happen, if we allow the climate system and, and the Earth systems in general to pass their tipping points, again, we're talking about complex systems, um, the, the global climate system, like all ecosystems as well, the ice shelves, the human brain, the human body, these are all complex systems and complex systems don't respond to stress in gradual and linear ways. They absorb stress and absorb stress, and then they suddenly tip into a different equilibrium state. If we allow that to happen, and at the moment we're not doing nearly enough to stop that from happening, and the likelihood is that it will happen, then that really is the end. That's the end of everything. I, I've taken interest in geology, and um, um, last weekend I was exploring some cliffs on the south coast of England, which record a post-extinction landscape from 250 million years ago, just after the Permo-Triassic extinction, when there's nothing. I mean, the cliffs are completely free of fossils. There's nothing left. And that's because over 90% of all species were wiped out by the Permo-Triassic extinction, which caused a, a domino effect of, of, of collapse across different ecosystems. It was triggered by a massive release of carbon dioxide and acid rain from, from a big volcanic area, um, and that then caused a cascading collapse of ecosystems. We're looking at the same thing. We've started this process of mass extinction, and if that happens, there will be nothing left for us or for the great majority of life forms on Earth. I mean, it, it, it might not affect me. I'm, I'm nearly 60, but for most people younger than me, I think you know, well, even I might see it in my lifetime, even I might see it, but I worry most for, for, for younger people because the prospects are simply terrifying. I mean, you know, if we allow this to happen, forget your dreams, forget your hopes, forget your nightmares, forget your plans, forget your prospects, forget everything. Everything becomes irrelevant. It's all gone. And oh. I just want people to grasp this. It's yeah. so frustrating you know having still i've been doing this for 37 years now and trying to explain to people the enormity of what we face and mm. just most of the time not getting through george we just had an uh, election in sweden and the party that would probably uh, be in government and uh, the, the party leader will be our prime minister i guess i think he said during the uh, debate before the election that no one needs to do, have to do any sacrifices to change the climate, to save the climate. We don't need to, to change anything. We don't need to do any sacrifices. And he's going to be prime minister probably in Sweden. Mm. So what is your advice to him, Ulf Kristersson? <laughs> I mean, look, this is, this is, <sighs> This is the means by which they get elected, by saying everything will be painless, you know, we'll carry on, business as usual. People are afraid of change. Um, I understand that, you know, we, 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 we're all born afraid of change, but, you know, the message we have to put across is that the, the very small changes we're asked to make, you know, to prevent climate catastrophe, um, which, yeah, you know, will mean that things have to change. They're not going to be the same. We do need to make certain sacrifices, but they're tiny. 
they're tiny by comparison to the unimaginable scale of change that will happen if we don't take this action. So we have these reassurances, we have this, these blandishments from politicians all over the world saying, I'm not going to hurt you, I'm not going to do anything to change business as usual. But they are going to hurt us. They're going to hurt us very profoundly. They're going to hurt us to an existential degree. I mean, we could see the end of everyone, yeah. but, but certainly the end of billions of people. Everyone here in the room, I guess, I think we all agree that it's a climate uh, crisis and economical crisis and uh, human crisis in every way. Um, <laughs> what can we do to create this global political will? Because it's a lack of political will to do the necessary changes. What can we do? Well, Maya, I think, in fairness, I answered that at the beginning. You know, it's that mass mobilization and it's reaching the 25% tipping point. That's what we need to do. So, you know, the, the way forward that Greta has shown us, that is the way that we need to follow. You know, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I you know, she's a great hero of mine, um, <laughs> as are um, the other great Fridays for Future leaders, because you know, they brought us hope when it seemed to be hopeless. You know, and, and you never know where the hope is going to come from. Um, and in this case, you know, they very nearly reach that point, very nearly, and they can reach it again. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And we can reach it again, rather. You know, it's not a question of they, you know, this is a question of a mobilization in which all of us have to play that part. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone has to glue themselves to the road. <laughs> you know, we need radical accountants, we need um, r radical writers, we need. Um, uh, Radical teachers, we need yeah. everybody right everybody. across the side. I have to and ask the audience here, who in here, here in the room is ready, would like to glue themselves to the road for the climate crisis? Up with your hands. You see, George? Do you see them? I can't see, see okay, them. Okay, no, but I can tell you, you there are a lot, almost Good. the majority, they're ready Good. to glue themselves to the roads. But, but would that change Sweden if somebody goes out and glue themselves to the road? Would it actually make such a big change? Well, if one person does it, it probably doesn't. But if if thousands of people do it, then yes, it would yeah, definitely. Wonderful. But but what the point I'm trying to make, Maya, if you don't mind, is yeah. is is that you know for every one person who glues themselves to the road, there needs to be 20 people supporting them in various ways, right? And all successful campaigns are an ecosystem. They bring together people using their particular skills or their particular forms of courage to best effect. And, and it's not that you know, everybody has to do the same thing, but it's a question of everybody using those particular things that they specialize in, that they're really good at, and deploying those, deploying that great range of professional skills, which I'm sure this audience has many, many different kinds, to best effect to, to make sure that this movement is, is unvanquishable, that, that we become the most successful movement in human history. And that does depend absolutely on courageous frontline people facing the wrath of the law, facing the wrath of the police, but it also depends on other people courageously spending their time, um, not, not necessarily threatened by the law, but you know, taking time out, uh, maybe, um, you know, um, not doing their job so much, doing <laughs> this uh, for, for, um, for a lot of their time instead. And that does require some degree of sacrifice, but it's, as I say, a very small sacrifice by comparison to the sacrifice of life on Earth, which is okay. what we're talking about. What kind of sacrifices do you do by, make by yourself? Do you eat red meat? Do you fly? Uh, no. I'm a vegan and I don't fly. Um, that's why I'm talking to you um, <laughs> by, 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 via Zoom. Yeah. Um, I was invited to come over, but yeah. um, the train journey would have taken a long, long time. <laughs> so I thought it's better to do to do it this way. Yeah. Um, um, and, and I apologize to the audience for not no, being there no, in person. No, no. But I'm, um, you know, I, I feel, yeah, we have to we have to live it. But you know, it doesn't mean I'm perfect by any means. Far, far from it. You know, I'm, I'm not. But, um, you know, I, we just have to you know, push ourselves as far as we possibly can, but most importantly, in the action we take. OK, we, we do have some power as consumers, largely negative power, the power not to do things, yeah. Yeah. 
damaging things, the power not to conform to what the advertisers and the governments tell us to conform to and not to take the choices to go on that holiday on the other side of the world or um, to eat that steak or whatever it might be. But actually, our major power is not as consumers, it is as citizens. It is mobilising, it is creating political change. That, above all else, is what we need to do. And yes, by all means, be a better consumer, but that is not going to change the world. You need to be a better citizen. Uh, <laughs> now, this change of system, this change of lifestyle globally, it, it, you write in one of your books about the future, the kind of society that you and your friends long for and want. If we say that we have a system of change, we all live more climate friendly, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of future do you th see for yourself, this type of paradise dream? Uh, what, what, would it, what would it look like? An ordinary day in a fossil free, sustainable future? Yeah, I'm not suggesting it would be paradise, but um, I, I think we could have very good lives while not threatening the lives of people on the other side of the world or the lives of future generations. Um, there's no need to play these things off against each other at all. Um, and already we see glimpses of what that could look like. So, for instance, um, if we look at Anne Hidalgo's plan in Paris, she's the mayor of Paris, and one of the things that she's instituted is this 15-minute city which um, it, the idea of which is that everything you need is within a 15 minute walk of where you live. So that radically reduces the need to travel. It radically reduces the traffic on the streets. And she's trying to get rid of most of the traffic on the streets to make the city far more livable. Um, you know, we could have a much better life um, if, if we had a life like that than a life spent in our cars creating massive pollution, uh, ruining the urban landscape. So it's initiatives like that which, which show that the, the two things are entirely compatible, leading a life that um, does not compromise the lives of others, and at the same time having a good life, a pleasant life, a life which is actually enjoyable to live. Um, I think we should be spending less time at work, especially if we're in, in a job which does performs no social benefit to other people and, 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 and to the living world. I think we should be um, um, spending more time with, with our friends and with our families and building our communities. Um, I think we should be spending less time traveling in, in general. Um, and we should be much more careful about the things we eat, but we could still have really rich and rewarding diets. Um, you know, the, 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 we've been presented with a whole load of false choices. You know, either you have a thriving society or you have an ecological society. But we can have a thriving ecological society. What do you... Thank you. <laughs> Applaud. So I think we should... We Now everybody knows that Greta Thunberg hasn't come and uh, George Bonbio is here. But what do you do in ordinary Saturday evening? Uh, me? Yeah. Uh, well, um, <laughs> um, usually not talking to an, to, to, to an audience in Jotterberry, but um, um, I guess, uh, well, right now I would probably be out on my kayak on the river um, and, uh, and bird watching from my kayak, which is one of the things that allows me to feel okay about the world. All oh, right. <laughs> Okay, what kind of birds do you see? I'm a, I'm myself a, a bad bird watcher. What kind of <laughs> right, birds do well, you see from a kayak? So so right here, um, just a, just a, a few hundred meters from my house, we're at the very top of an estuary. Yeah. And um, so uh, yesterday I was out there and I was watching egrets catching fish, which was uh, very interesting to see. There were lots of kingfishers, um, herons, cormorants. Um, uh, sandpipers, little wading birds on, on the shoreline, uh, several different species of ducks and geese, um, uh, a few other waders, and then a few songbirds in, in the trees uh, as I went past yeah. as well. So, I mean, all together, it's just a rich and rewarding experience. And then I saw a seal and huh? lots of fish rising and stuff. And, and, the th and I, I am very lucky, you know, I can, I can do this very easily, but it's a sort of very low impact way of having a fantastic time. 
time. <laughs> Wonderful. So it's bird watching for uh, uh, fossil free future, you could say, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. All right. Let's try to end this in a positive note, if possible. Those mornings when you're not depressed and sad over the situation, what are you thinking of? Where do you find your mm. hope? Well, I find a lot of hope in people. I think that you know we are we're a lot better than we're told we are. Um, there's a very wide range of um, academic studies in neuroscience and anthropology and social psychology, showing that actually the great majority of people are well motivated. Um, our values are dominated by altruism, by empathy, by community feeling, by benevolence towards others. We all have some selfishness and greed, but these are not our dominant values. Uh, but we're constantly told that they are, and it's a myth about humanity. It's simply wrong. However, these selfishness and greed often are the dominant values of those who run governments and run business. And again, there's a lot of academic work showing this. It's you can boil it down to this, that we're a society of altruists governed by psychopaths. Now, my hope for people is that we allow that altruism to come to the fore. We, we don't let those psychopaths continue to lie to us and tell us that we are like them because we're not like them. Those who govern us are woefully unrepresentative of society as a whole. So we must allow our good nature to come to the fore. And the great majority of people I meet are just great. They're wonderful. They're brilliant. I mean, you know, almost everyone I come across, I think that is a lovely person. And, and we are. We generally are. You know, we're told to be suspicious of other people and, to, and to, 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 to be cautious about other people. But my experience suggests, no, we should embrace almost everyone we meet. There's just a very small proportion of society who we should be, untrustful and suspicious of but unfortunately a lot of the time those are the ones in charge thank you george monbiot thank you so much for talking and inspiring us and i rec personally recommend you to subscribe for the guardian where george writes very interesting articles and he's also a writer written a lot of books so Go out and read George Monbiot. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank, Thank you, you to the Thanks, everyone. Uh -huh. Jag sitter helst. En konkret sak som vi alla kan göra som bor i Sverige. Speciellt om man bor i Stockholm så har nio av mina häktade vänner rättegång den 30 september.